Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the front-end track with its first talk called Strangler Application Pattern, a legacy front-end use case. As you can see in the first slide, there will be a lot of GIFs in this talk, so I hope to keep you enjoyed during the talk. But let's start. And let's start with a question that, in my opinion, is not simple at all. What makes a code base a legacy one? When the code that you love so much starts to become legacy code? Um, in my opinion, the first symptom is when you fear to modify the code. Probably you all know this sensation. You have, you have that if statement and you want to change it, but you're afraid that you break up everything because you don't have unit test, you don't have continuous integration, as you have, and you have fear. And after a while, you start asking yourself, European curriculum vitae or recommendation letter? What is better to change up? Uh, but this is, a, this is a, or or on a personal point of view, okay? It's on myself. But when a legacy code is legacy for the organization? I think that this picture, it's uh, quite a ex good example of legacy code. Uh, what I mean is that we as developers are the dog and the code is the cage. But the cage to what? For an organization, for me, code is legacy when it's not easily adaptable to new business needs. Please try to keep in mind this definition because now I want to tell you a story. Uh, it was 2013 and we need to start the new Greenfield project. This project is called Clients Pew. Clients Plus, if you want. And it's a clients, not clients, because it's Latin and not English. And what we had to do was a porting of a desktop business management software to a single page application. It was a software for lawyers. And, you know, it was 2013, we were younger, and we chose AngularJS. Uh, right now I see this face on someone. I know, I know, I know, I know. Uh, that's, an, that's a problem, I know. Uh, but in my opinion, back then, it was a good choice. Uh, it was a good choice for two reasons. The first one is it was a de facto standard in 2013. Uh, now we joke about that, but, but in 2013 or 2014, people were talking about AngularJS here in this conference. So it was quite cool also. We can find libraries, we can find uh, um, questions, answers on Stack Overflow, and not that kind of stuff. Okay, everyone was using AngularJS, and that was a good point. But the other one, and perhaps most importantly, is the fact that for our client, that was an experimental business. Why it was an experiment? Because that was a really old desktop application that the user uh, used for 10 years, for perhaps more. And they want to try to transform it in a web application. They don't know didn't know, sorry, if it was a good idea to invest in that. So the point is, when you need, when you are an experimental business, what the thing that you need most as developer? It's quick feedback. You need to go in production as fast as you can in order to get feedback from your users and change your software accordingly to your feedbacks. But to have fee quick feedback, you need velocity. Your top priority as developer, if you are doing an experiment, it's velocity. And at that time, for that team and this project, 
AngularJS was the right choice for the velocity. I'm not trying to justify myself, but uh, it's, it's true. So we really decided to stick with Angular. Now, back to the future, back to now, in 2018, and the software now is a commercial success. Luckily for us, and luckily for our client. The point is the desktop application is dead. It's no more. No one uses that anymore. And most importantly, that application, it's the core business of our client. Uh, they, our client has a, a backend in Java, and they are working to keep that backend working for another decade, perhaps. So, velocity, it's now not a priority for us, not anymore. What our client needs today for that single page application is longevity and not velocity. So you, you can understand what I'm trying to say, that, that we have a problem. Why we have a problem? We have a problem because, as you all know, probably, uh, let's say that Angular is not on you know, the top of the wave anymore. And the point is that if you think about a very, very long term, and I'm talking about 10 years in the future, probably you will never find um, a developer, a young developer from university that wants to work with AngularJS. So AngularJS, now, if you're talking about longevity, it's a cost for our client. Okay? Legacy, anyone? You understand what I mean at the beginning of my talk? The point is that it's not technically our code that changes, that make it legacy, but the context around our project changed the code. And this is now that we have legacy code in our application, and we have a problem. Or better, we still don't have a problem, but it's that kind of problem that we need to solve now in order to not throw everything away in the future. I think that everyone understands what I mean. You have that kind of code that you can't touch anymore. Right now, we still can do something. And then, that is the question. Okay, okay, we had a meeting, all the team together, and they say, okay, AngularJS, it's no more an option. But, okay, what to use instead of AngularJS? And we start talking, okay, we start with, uh, okay, let's use Angular, because we have a lot of forms in our application, we have the form builder, and TypeScript is so cool, because you have type checker, we are going to do a lot of, we are not going to do a lot of stu stupid errors. On the other hand, we add, oh, but why not React? React is way, way cooler. It's from Facebook, it's components, it's very, very cool, and we can decide our state management library in the future, we can change it. Okay, but, but let's talk about the main topic, it's longevity. Do you really think that if we choose Angular 2 or React today, in 10 years we don't have the same problem that we have now? Probably in, in I don't know where I will work in 10 years, obviously, but the team in 10 years will probably curse us to have chosen a framework again, like we curse ourselves to have chosen AngularJS. Uh, so what I'm saying is that is that no solution to this problem, but what we decided to do was to take a, a very dangerous decision, but also a brave one, uh, and we decided to go completely frameworkless. Almost completely, obviously. We are going, we are using a uh, specific library to solve a specific problem, but we are not using any kind of generic purpose frameworks. So we are using ECMA 6 with van vanilla JS because right, it's not 2008 anymore. Right now we have a way, way cooler framework, uh, sorry, language. 
we have import export, we have classes, we have a lot of things. So we can do very, very powerful stuff with Vanilla.js today. On the other hand, we're also using custom elements. So we create components like in Angular or React, but without using any kind of framework. OK, we found the perfect solution. We don't want to use any framework anymore. But the point is, OK, I still have my Angular application. So how can I, how can, what can I say to my client? Uh, sorry, we made a mistake five years ago. Or better, we made the right choice five years ago. But today, perhaps we need to write everything from scratch. Do you think it's actually an option? For me, it almost every, every time it's no. Because it's not an option in this case. Because we have a very, very huge application. We are very, very, very huge. And the client is actually making money from it. So we can just stop the development for six months and rebuild everything anew. We needed to find another kind of solution. And we, then we came up with this pattern called, called Strangler application. This kind of pattern, it's, uh, it's easier to explain with a photo. What, are you, what do you see here is an ivy, it's a, an ivy that is covering a wall. What happens if I put an ivy on a wall and I wait for 10 years? Probably the ivy will cover all over the wall and you don't see the wall back anymore. That is the main concept of the Strangler application. Now I'm trying to explain you better with some weird graphic that I made. This is the start application, okay? We use AngularJS and I explained why we choose AngularJS. And we use Grunt for building, minifying, and everything, and that the stuff. Then we inject inside the application another application based on JavaScript, vanilla, and custom elements, and Webpack to build everything together. They live together. It's just one application, but a part of that is living in a separate world. Then the application, the new application grows bigger because every time we have this simple rule, every time that you have to make a commit on the old application, the first commit should be move that in the new application. So we can't touch the legacy application anymore. That's the only rule that we decided on our team. So with time, and actually in the real project, we are about, uh, I think, 80%. I'm not sure, I'm, I didn't count actually, but uh, with a quick look, it was around 80%. But at last, the old application will disappear. OK, I probably are curious enough to understand how this thing actually works. So let's do a demo. OK, let's do a demo. You have here a very simple AngularJS application AngularJS 1.2, because uh, it's the application, it, it's the version that we have in production right now. It's just a simple tweet clone with a list of Twitter and a form with a new tweet. You can write your tweet. You see the progress bar. You have charter left. Then you click send. You wait for a moment and you return to the list. This is the application. Okay. Let's take a, a quick look at the code. I know it's strange to see Angular JS code in a conference, but um, it exists again. It exists in, a, in a, a lot of repositories, so it's good to see that uh, every once in a while. Um, as you can see, we have root provider with roots. We have list controller, tweet controller, and so on. Our list controller uses tweet service to, you know get the data from the service, putting it on the scope, and printing on the screen. Then we have the tweet controller that is a form, that is a, a scope tweet that is uh, with ng model to the text area. I don't want to show you all the code of Angular, OK? Please. 
Then we, when we click, just call tweets.send, that is simulate the sending the tweet to a server, and then we go back. Let's take a look for a moment at uh, how are the tweet service is built. We have HTTP and, H and Q as uh, dependencies, because list is an actual HTTP request, but Q, but the send, sorry, is just a fake promise, okay? And you understand why I'm using this example in a moment. But I want to show you something strange. Like a look at console. It's not really readable, but this will, it's written, this will strangle our legacy code. This code is, this file, is the index of the another directory called S6. It's not the source directory, that is our original application. It's the ESX, and it's just a console log, like you can see. But this file is processed by Webpack and put in the index HTML. So we use Webpack to create a file that we put in the app bundle that Grant makes everything together and make in production. We created two build steps to create one single application. Let's go on. What I have done now is to move the, serv the tweet service to ECMA 6. The point is that new code should, depend, should not depend on Angular anymore. And you know that in ECMA 6 I can use fetch to do HTTP request and new promise to create promise. So I don't depend on Angular. But now we have a problem. The other part of the application, like for example list, actually is using tweets as a service in Angular. So we have our ECMA 6, ECMA 6 application that doesn't know Angular. This is important. We don't need Angular in the ECMA 6 application, but we need that the ECMA 6 code actually is readable by Angular. And we created a little trick that actually in production it's a bit more trickier, but this is a trick. We attach to window, that is the only way to communicate with this, this true application, a function called bind to Angular. And uh, Angular is a parameter. So we invoke Angular service inside the ECMA 6 application, but without depending on it. When our application is uh, completely written of Angular, we are going to strip out this part, and we are OK. So last thing, I can show you how we removed also controller with custom elements. I created a tweet page template that you can see here, and the tweet page custom element. Okay, I don't want to I don't want you to show the code, but it's very but quite long. But it's a simple custom element. The point is that now, doing that, the Angular JS application does not know no more the controller, just the template. My tweet app page. So we moved a complete an entire controller to a new application, and the, the only point that knows this thing is the roots. When we are completely removed Angular, we are going to rewrite our root algorithm, and we are done. That's how we are going to work. OK. Let's continue. This is how we did this thing, and how are we doing this thing. But what did we learn? The first thing that we learn is uh, don't be rational, but be reason reasonable. When you need to solve this kind of problem, sometimes you don't. Uh, you need to think out of, out of the box, because we are all. This is not the perfect solution. We are creating another build system. Perhaps the bundle, total bundle, could be bigger because we have the, you know, webpack stuff, that grant stuff. But it's working. Our client is happy, so. It's good enough. Be reasonable and not be rational. Or not too much. I know that asking a developer to not be rational, it's hard. But uh, you can manage, I think. Uh, the other thing is, this is a quote from Martin Fowler. When designing a new application, you should design in such a way as to make it easier to strangle it in the future. This is an important thing. 
Now we learn how to strangle an application, and it, it was hard. I can say that it was very hard to come up with this solution. So the point is, if your point is longevity, you know that your code should become legacy and should be strangled in the future. So please try to think, it's a very, very hard thing, but try to think how to make it easier for you or for your team in the future to do that. Okay, the talk is finished, but I want to share with you what, which, what it started with this application. We created a, a, a new application with just vanilla JS, and we talked about how we choose framework and when we can work with our frameworks. And uh, after a year that we started working on this thing, we decided to launch a frameworkless movement. What I mean with the frameworkless movement is a group of people interested, committed to understand how frameworks works under the hood, and interested in work without them. Also, the most important thing is interested in making good technological decision about frameworks. It is not easy at all. If you want to get involved, and I will like that you get involved, you can just go to GitHub Frameworkless Movement Manifesto, you find uh, some information about it. We are going to create a manifesto about this movement, but we want to do that with uh, involving the community. So if you want to join us, just m send us an email. You find the email address on the repo. Open an issue. If you, are dis if you disagree with us, open an issue. It's not a problem. We want to discuss with you. And I'll put the star, everything. This is the main source of information about the movement. My name is Francesco Strazzullo. I am a front-end engineer for X strategy. This is the way you can contact me. Contact me anytime you want. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>